Uh, I'm Greg Rosenbaum. I'm the Senior Director for South by Southwest EDU. Um, as this year's South by Southwest EDU Conference and Festival comes to a close, I just want to take a moment to share a deep appreciation for all that you do as a community to make this event and experience all that it is. It's truly community fueled from the beginning to the end, and we thank you for that. This week we came together to explore the future of learning, to examine the new potential of innovations and showcase the amazing work of learners and leaders across education. Whether it be in sessions, meetups, the podcast stage, films, performances, competitions, or roundtables, I hope you unlock some new discoveries along the way. Please join us to celebrate the conclusion of this year's festival at Lester Pearl on Rainy Street following the keynote um, for our closing party. Now turning to why we are here today. One of the aspirations of South by Southwest EDU is to shine a light on important, timely, relevant topics that sit at the heart of education and society. Serving students, families, and communities is what brings us together. Today's keynote, Safer Schools, Students, Educators, and Mental Health One Year After Uvalde, will address one of the most pressing issues facing communities across the country, and sadly, something that has continued to persist. We are grateful to have partnered with the Texas Tribune, the nonpartisan media organization who has been a leader in covering the tragedy of Uvalde over the last year. And I'm excited to have them host this conversation. Sewell Chan, the editor in chief of the Texas Tribune, is a longtime journalist whose recent accomplishments include overseeing coverage that was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 2021. Before welcoming Sewell to the stage, I would like to share that you can add your questions and you can upvote questions through the Engage button in the South by Southwest EDU mobile app. Please join me in welcoming Sewell Chan to the stage. Hello, thank you for joining us today for this very special discussion. My name is Sewell Chan, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. On May 24, 2022, a gunman took the lives of 19 students and two educators at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. This was the deadliest school shooting in the history of Texas, and the second deadliest shooting at an elementary, middle, or high school in the history of the United States. For the past year, nearly the past year, our journalists at the Texas Tribune have been producing hundreds of stories about this tragedy and its ramifications for public policy. I'm very honored to have been able to organize and host today's panel discussion on safer schools, students, educators, and mental health one year after Uvalde. I will begin by um, introducing Nick Allen, Nick is a professor of clinical psychology who runs the Center for Digital Mental Health at the University of Oregon. Our next speaker is Otis Johnson, Jr., who is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor and uh, the head of the Johns Hopkins Center for Healthy and Safe Schools at Johns Hopkins University. And finally, please give a warm welcome to Kimberly Mata Rubio, Lexi's mom and the founder of Lives Robbed. Let's begin. Kimberly, your life changed completely on May 24th of 2022. Could you begin this discussion by telling us about your journey? Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is Alexandria Rubio, and she's one of the victims of the Rob Elementary shooting. Um, you know, on that day, it was, it was just another day 
getting ready for the end of the year. Uh, we had award ceremonies. Um, Lexi received the All A Honor Roll Award and the Good Citizen Award. Um, we took photos with her. The last photo we have with her is at 10.59 that morning. And we promised her ice cream after school as a reward. And we said we would see her after school, told her we loved her. And then my husband and myself, we left, left her at school. Um, I was working for the summer with the Valdi Leader News. So I went back, was at my desk writing a story for the upcoming week. And we started to hear uh, traffic on the scanner. Mm -hmm. um, something about a shooting nearby, nearby street. The crime reporter before didn't think anything of it other than how terrible and it's gonna be a long week trying to get in touch with law enforcement to get that published. It's, it's a blur after that. Uh, I remember going to the school, the chaos, law enforcement, parents, everybody is hysterical. I'm worried. But they tell us that we're gonna be reunited with the children at the Civic Center. So we just need to head over there and wait for the kids. We waited, but bus after bus, I think it was four buses total, and she, she didn't come off any of those buses. She wasn't there. Didn't see her teacher, didn't see any classmates. At that point, we know it's not good. We figure she's either in the hospital, best case scenario, worst case scenario, she's still at Rob. Um, we went to the hospital. We, a family, a friend took us. Uh, we gave her description, her name. She's not there. My dad drove to San Antonio about an hour and a half away. Checked the university there. She's not there. I don't know why, but we think to go to the funeral home just to, just to see if they have anybody yet. She's not there. Um, I asked to go back to Rob. They tell me it's not a good idea. You're not going to get the answers there. But I'm like, I want to go back to Rob. So I had sandals on that day to look nice for the award ceremony. I took them off and ran about a mile to her school. At that point, it felt like I was in the right place. So I think a part of me knows mm -hmm. she never made it out of the school. But you really cling to hope, you, you know, cling to anything. So eventually we got a ride back to the Civic Center where they were asking for descriptions, official descriptions of all the children that were missing still. Sat down and waited. At one point they come and grab us and tell us they're gonna take us somewhere quieter to wait. And my husband got up immediately and followed. I looked at a woman, I don't remember who it was now, and I just told her I don't want to go with them because I know they're not taking us just because it's quieter. As soon as we enter that room, they tell us our daughter was one of the victims. We had no idea how many victims there were. The days after, there's just... How did, how did this happen to her? How did this happen to me? How did this happen to us? I think people have asked, at what point did you decide that you were gonna speak out, that you were gonna you know, become an activist? There was never a decision in my mind. It was just, this is the only way, this is the way. I have to make sure that other moms aren't put in this position because this pain is just, No one should feel like this. And I also want people to remember Lexi for more than how she died. She, she's brilliant, she's intelligent, she's beautiful, she's athletic, she's driven. She had her whole life in front of her and this world really misses out by not having her contribute. But I guess my hope is that in some 
way she still is. So we've been to DC asking for a complete ban on assault weapons. We've been at the state level asking for the bare minimum, raise the age to purchase these types of weapons from 18 to 21, increase background checks, juvenile records. I hope I'm making a difference. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Johnson, let's start with you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the context for understanding school shootings in America. It seems that they are at one end of a spectrum of activity that contributes to vulnerability uh, and harm in public schools. Can you help give us the context for the mass shooting phenomena in the United States and what can be done around it? Sure. Um, first, Kimberly, your activism is inspiring. So thank you for being here and for what you're doing. Um, so we need to understand school shootings within a broader scope of mass shootings. And I think our problem has been to localize these shootings within schools and expect schools to do something to stop them. What can we do to make schools safer tends to be the question asked after each one of these events. Um, but the truth is, we just have in the United States a problem with gun violence and that schools are just one context among many in which we find these mass shootings. Um, in 2022, we had 647 mass shootings in the United States. That's roughly for about 11 months to a day. Um, so this is not an isolated event. It happens in malls, it happens in grocery stores, uh, and it happens within schools. I think once we start to contextualize um, or understand those shootings um, with that framing, then we'll understand that the only way to keep schools safe is to actually have gun violence policy and to have effective um, remedies, um, such as the ones that Kimberly mentioned. I would add to that, uh, we have technologies available now, biometric fingerprint um, locks on guns and, and, and gun storage devices, woefully underutilized. And it's something that we can um, uh, mandate with, with gun purchases. Um, a number of other things that uh, I think we need to disabuse ourselves of is this doubling down on strategies that we know have been ineffective. Mm -hmm. School resource officers, have been put in schools in greater numbers um, over the years, but yet in the last eight years, we've had year over year increases in injury and death um, for eight years. We also have uh, this belief that cameras or maybe even AI and, and facial recognition uh, uh, programs can make those schools safer. But once again, those technologies have been proliferating in schools um, along with police officers and other technologies um, year over year, and nonetheless, we still have these, these rises in injury and death. So it's clear that we need to try something different. Mm -hmm. And I think the Bipartisan Safer Communities uh, Act was a move in the right direction because it tied gun prevention policy or violence, gun violence prevention policy with schooling and mental health services which brings about um, a more comprehensive view of school safety, and I hope we continue in, in that direction. A quick follow-up. After the Uvalde tragedy, um, there was a lot of controversy over the law enforcement response. In total, 376 law enforcement officers responded to the Uvalde tragedy, yet it took nearly an hour and 20 minutes before the gunman was intercepted and taken out and the survivors could be attended to and the deceased attended to. Uvalde had its own police department, a small force of about four or five officers. We know now that they failed to establish a clear command and control structure over the law enforcement response. What is the correct relationship between policing um, and schools in your view? Right now it's a very diverse relationship. We have police officers, like you said, that are part of the school system, um, police agencies established by schools. 
We have those who check in at the front office. They're, they're really patrolling. Mm -hmm. They're on beats. Um, then we have those that are off-duty officers that are contracted to be um, on school premises, either during school hours or at after-school events. So we have this wide uh, uh, continuum of SRO definition and um, uh, accountability. But what I think you're mentioning here is, is really um, uh, a systemic failure of coordination and also planning around uh, police responses to school environments in particular. So we know that schools are particularly soft targets, unfortunately, um, and they are different than, than, than other more public uh, venues and, and uh, officers need to have a protocol about how to respond to those situations. After the shooting, several Texas politicians suggested, well, why don't we harden the schools more? Why don't we limit the number of entrances to a school? Um, why don't we put in more cameras uh, um, and even um, making it easier to arm uh, teachers? Uh, actually, the um, agriculture commissioner who oversees food nutrition programs in Texas suggested that school cafeteria workers might be armed in order to be able to intercept a school shooter. What do you make of such ideas? <laughs> My laughter is not, uh, you know, in response to the severity of the issue, but I, um, th the same questions that we have about gun safety um, should apply to all carriers of firearms. And so I think in Texas recently we had a superintendent who came into a school and left, I think, the firearm within a bathroom and the student found the firearm. Um, I'm really skeptical of these exemptions that they're uh, 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 offering or allowing within states, uh, Utah, Texas, Ohio being one of the recent ones, um, because they're, they're, they're deciding that um, uh, in order to stop the, the gun uh, uh, control advocates um, from using training and these other things as a way to stall the implementation of these exemptions. Um, they're allowing no training. Uh, and, and I think that's just the wrong way to go to expect um, teachers who are not professionals with a firearm mm -hmm. to then be allowed to, to carry those and for it to be aligned with conceal and carry where the school principal may not even know who's having, who has the firearm within um, the school building. So yes, I'm, 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 I'm very troubled by those responses and I think they're gonna be ineffective and, and potentially harmful for kids. Professor Allen, um, in Uvalde, the gunmen had um, a history of disturbing social media messages. Uvalde, unfortunately, is also a community with a severe shortage of youth, adolescent, teen, mental health services. Mm -hmm. I believe that the nearest such expertise, uh, adolescent psychiatrists were really in San, the San Antonio area, mm -hmm. which is nearly an hour away. What is the state of knowledge about teen mental health mm -hmm. and trying to detect deeply troubled uh, uh, people before they can do harm? So I think one of the really concerning things about the current public debate around this phenomena is the way in which it has been, uh, mental health policy and gun policy has been pitted against each other as if they are alternatives. Now I've been working in the mental health field my whole life and particularly in youth mental health and I'm always very pleased when people want to give uh, attention and resources to mental health services but very often the discussion around mental health is seen as an alternative to gun safety policy. And I think these things absolutely have to work together. So, so let's, let's talk about the mental health issue here. Um, there is clearly a mental health component to understanding the, the people who perpetrate these difficulties, but it's, it's, a, it's of a very specific type. And so one of the problems we have when we attribute um, 
this sort of violence to mental health difficulties is that it tends to stigmatise all people who experience mental health difficulties, many of whom would never act this way under any circumstances and would be horrified. So the, the literature that has studied perpetrators of, of mass shootings, including school shootings, has shown some very clear patterns. The vast majority of the perpetrators, the vast majority, are male. Uh, they are, tend to be socially isolated. They rarely have a formal mental health diagnosis. And yet they are... Um, uh, and, and one term that has been used, which I think is actually quite useful to understand this phenomena, is the term aggrieved entitlement. So often the person has a sense that they were owed or deserved something from life that they did not receive. And I think understanding that, particularly in the context of masculinity, is a really important question for us to understand here. And they feel they've been wronged in some way, but yes. why? Well, often it has to do with various um, challenges to their status. So it may be the social isolation, it may be the breakdown of relationships, it may be using a job, uh, losing a job, it may be being uh, uh, asked to leave school, there's a whole, that may be experiences of bullying and so forth. But, but, the, but the thing that is different is one way to understand these acts is as acts of suicide, because many of the perpetrators see these things as a final act, something that they don't expect to survive. And yet most people who find themselves in the situation of uh, experiencing suicidal feelings or intentions would never want to hurt anyone else. So this is very different because the person is not only feeling this impulse to end their life, but they want to do it in a way that displays some kind of control or power. The other thing that's very important here that's related to the mental health debate is that unfortunately for many of the people who uh, commit these acts, they are actually very unlikely to seek help because they see seeking help as a sign of weakness and, and something that may be further challenging to their standing and masculinity. So what I'm leading up to is simply providing more mental health services within schools, which, by the way, I'll just say, is very valuable in its own right, is, is not going to be a solution to this particular phenomena because the people who commit these heinous acts are usually very unlikely to seek help. Hmm. So we actually need a different kind of um, program that helps to identify particularly young men who are isolated and experiencing these kinds of dislocations. And then, yes, it would be very good if they also didn't have access to a gun. Are there, example, uh, are there examples of successful interventions along the lines you describe? So, to be blunt, the most successful interventions internationally are ones that have, result, have reduced the number of firearms into the com in the community. And, and that doesn't mean that there aren't other programs that can be developed with the new understandings that we're developing of the phenomena. But if you want to look internationally, and probably many of you can tell that I have an Australian accent, I, 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 I will point out I'm a US citizen and I, my family is growing up here, so I definitely have skin in the game for this country, absolutely. But, 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 you know, the experience in Australia is interesting as a contrast. Australia is a very similar, it's not identical, but it's a very similar country to the US. It has a colonial history, it has a frontier history, it, it has very similar uh, roots. And yet the, the rate of this phenomena in Australia is dramatically lower. And, you know, as I think you know, Phil, we've discussed that there was a very, a horrific mass shooting in Australia. And what... In, in 1996? In 1996 in, uh, in Tasmania, in Port Arthur. And a person had a semi-automatic weapon, was able to, to take the lives of many people. Now, what was different was that there was a moral outrage at that event. And here's the critical thing. 
It was shared on the conservative side of politics. So the, the government that was in, yeah, I think this is absolutely critical. The government that was in power at the time was a conservative government. And they took the action to change the laws and to reduce the number of firearms in the community. And, and, and I think that, you know, we struggle with this sense of helplessness here in the United States with these events occurring so many times. And, you know, I think we need to have, we need to maintain our sense of moral outrage mm -hmm. about the events, that this is absolutely unacceptable, but that that needs to be shared across the political spectrum. Ms. Rubio, you've been meeting with lawmakers and policymakers, of course, from both parties. And you come from a community, Uvalde, that is a more conservative community. How has your message and the outrage that so many millions of Texans feel, and frankly, the despair that many of us feel, how widespread, how, how, how is that message getting through to the variety of leaders and influencers that you're meeting with? I would say that the message is getting through. Are they really comprehending it, understanding it? taking some of this pain, can they, can they understand it? That I'm not sure of. Um, you know, some meetings are frustrating. Others, we leave with hope. You know, I've had some meetings yesterday with at least three Republicans who were in favor of raising the age from 18 to 21. And I think the parents in the room, we just cried, just tears of relief. Maybe this is it. Mm -hmm. I wish something had been done sooner, but I hope that you can look at these children and think that's enough. Earlier today, you had the opportunity to meet with um, um, a parent uh, who's um, lost her son in uh, the Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012. Has it, what has been the process been like of being part of sadly, really truly a community now of people who've either survived or have lost loved ones to mass shootings? I mean, it's comforting to meet them in a way because there's no judgment and they share this pain and I understand and they understand. But it's also terrifying because they're a mirror into what my future is. And there's so much pain still that you sit and you realize that this is never gonna get better. That we're just be, walking around with this pain until it's our time and we're reunited with our loved one. As you've gotten involved in more activism, how have, um, has your relationship with the other Uvalde parents evolved? Um, we're very close. You can see the majority of the families in Austin weekly, lately. Um, you know, we might have different priorities and we might navigate this journey differently, but we all agree that we want the bare minimum of raising the age from 18 to 21 to be able to purchase these weapons. That's something that we all can agree on. That's our focus right now, at least in Texas. And when you have heard, what kind of resistance have you heard to that idea from people who, who don't support it? Yeah, there's a lot of resistance from older men who are not 18. Um, and that resistance is just that they have rights. The Second Amendment's thrown around a lot, but you know the argument we've always countered with is that you know to be able to buy tobacco, you have to be 21. If you want to gamble, if you want to drink alcohol, how you think it's okay for an 18-year-old to purchase a weapon that can just murder people in mass numbers? Yeah. I well, don't understand it. And the gunman in Uvalde, of course, purchased an AR-15 style rifle. Legally. Legally, shortly after turning 18. And he, from the evidence we've seen, didn't even really fully know how to use it at first. And yet he had access to such lethality. We also know that the gunman left behind very disturbing messages on social media. And I'm curious about your view on uh, social media. Uh, is it the culprit for the epidemic of loneliness isolation and anxiety that young people are reporting? Is it part of the problem, but, but, but really kind of more of a symptom of something deeper that's underlying it? So I do want to say that I think 
when we talk about social media, we have to make sure that we don't put the entire experience of social media into one bucket. Social media, like every technology, has benefits and it has risks. And this is true of every piece of technology we've ever invented. So, it, so social media has some very profound benefits for young people who use it. They feel connected, they feel entertained, they, you know, it, it, it provides, if you're a young LGBT person in a rural area, then social media might be a lifeline for you to find a community that really gives your life uh, richness and meaning it would not otherwise have. So there is, there is a positive part to social media, but there is also a, 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 a risks that are associated with it. And as a society, what, that's what we need to do. We need to understand what the risks are and how do we manage them better. Just as we do with automobiles or anything you know, that we, we use. So in this particular context, I think, you know, I think we're well, most of us are well aware that there's a phenomena, I've described before some of the psychological factors that lead people to this point. If you're a young man, you feel isolated, you feel disrespected, you, you don't have a community context. You can go online and you can find people who will mirror that back to you and who will exacerbate that and tell you not how to solve the problem, but who to blame. And that can, and that can result in, uh, there's a process we study with adolescents called co-rumination, which is the idea of two or more young people who, sit, who, who interact in a way where they, they understand each other's problems, but they also exacerbate them. And this can happen online. And, and so often young people who would not otherwise think of taking acts like this will do so because they're exposed to some information online. The other thing, of course, is that social media has this broadcasting element. And so if you are, if one of the goals in an act like this is to show people that you are powerful and you are in control and this is your final act, which asserts your power, then you can, it may, it may appeal to you the idea of broadcasting that act and some of these uh, events have been broadcast by the perpetrators, which shows the, that their goal is to let everyone know. Uh, and so the appeal of that is another, is another disturbing act of, of, um, of social media. One of the uh, complex issues is, as you said, the perpetrator in Uvalde and many other perpetrators do leave behind a digital trail that can be under, you know, that al allows us to understand that. Now that creates both an opportunity and a risk. One, there is the opportunity, could you detect this earlier and prevent it and intervene? But of course that has to be weighed against a series of actually quite complex problems about privacy, about what happens when we have what's called a false positive, where we, someone says something and then we run in and try to intervene and it wasn't that situation. So we don't really have the answers there yet, but I think it's clearly, something that we should be investigating because prevention and early intervention could prevent a certain number of these events. Dr. Johnson, your view on social media and its contributions to the, the, the epidemic of gun violence? Well, I agree with everything Nick just said, um, both positives and negatives. Um, I think the monitoring of um, where our children go in terms of you know social media, what sites they visit, what communities they join, uh, has been seen as perhaps a way to go. You mm -hmm. know something that um, educators uh, should do, and uh, it it was something that we we ended up doing quite frequently with the online and hybrid education during the pandemic. Technology such as Gaggle and some others. Mm -hmm. um, claim to have this predictive health uh, uh, feature where perhaps uh, through word choice and, and some other ways of monitoring um, uh, student statements that we can intervene in case uh, there's a mental health crisis. Um, but my work has been looking at surveillance and trying to understand what are the costs mm -hmm. for those false positives that mm -hmm. Nick just mentioned. And in general, hardening schools with surveillance, um, additional monitoring, um, has some, some other 
consequences that are beyond um, you know, whether the shooter gains entry or, or what have you, or whether the, the student um, decides to, to get a gun, but also to their social emotional well-being and their academic standing. Mm -hmm. So our work has shown that those schools that are in the top third of the U.S. Uh, distribution of high schools in their use of security cameras, SROs, and all of these other ways to securitize uh, these environments actually have lower mathematics scores, they have lower college going rates mm -hmm. than those schools that are in the, th the, the bottom third in their use or reliance of these on these technologies. So it's, there is the, the primary mission of schools, mm -hmm. right? To educate and equip kids to be uh, successful, healthy, um, happy mm -hmm. uh, in their futures. And what we've done is double down on all of these these surveillance technologies uh, that actually undermine that outcome. Should schools have metal detectors, even elementary schools? Well, it's not so much of what the school has, okay? Um, but it is about these other components that need to be in place so that those, those students feel like students instead of suspects. Right? They need to be in schools where there's uh, feelings of attachment, where mm -hmm. they feel like they belong, where their aspirations are affirmed, where they're nurtured. And oftentimes, these same places where we see the proliferation of these technologies are the same places that treat our kids like suspects. Mm -hmm. And that's when they abuse the suspension, uh, and we see, again, these disparities um, in, in their educational and social emotional outcomes. So I, I want to say that there are costs to us doubling down on, on the technology that we know has not stopped the year over year rise in injury and death. What is your, had your daughter felt safe at, element, at her elementary school? Yes, all my children felt safe. Um, I mentioned before that we considered moving from Uvalde. Um, I wanted to give my children more than I grew up with, but one of the benefits was Uvalde was safe. Mm -hmm. And now that that's been taken away. You feel the school was, was a safe environment for your daughter to learn in. Mm -hmm. Do you? What are, your, what are your thoughts about the disorganized uh, law enforcement response? Yeah. Um, so many things went wrong that day mm -hmm. from nobody picking up on this disturbed person to exterior doors that were unlocked to a faulty lock on the interior door and to law enforcement response. The first few officers that arrived at the scene had a chance to intervene and they chose not to. Um, have my daughter's autopsy report. I know that her injury was fast, but we don't know at what point she received those injuries. So we'll never know how scared she was and for how long. It's heart-wrenching. Um, where do we go from here as a society? I, you know, I'm old enough to remember Columbine, which happened right after I finished college, certainly Newtown, then Parkland. I sense that the outrage is there. And if you actually look at public opinion polling, most people support some form of gun safety reform. And yet for obvious political reasons, that has been so difficult. Hmm. Are we at a breaking point? Will we ever reach one? Well, I think the passage of the legislation last year was a, a breaking point. I mean, we had not in over two decades passed any um, gun legislation uh, response, you know, through Congress. So um, I, I recognize that as a start. It definitely isn't where we need to be, mm -hmm. and we definitely need to go further. Um, but I think the framework is there, uh, meaning that the essential components are there. There needs to be funding for schools to, to have security. There needs to be mental health um, services uh, 
some of those funds could be used for restorative justice approaches, mm -hmm. trauma-informed practices. I know lots of schools, um, schools, cities, and police agencies are trying those al alternative approaches uh, that are less punitive and actually try to heal and repair these relationships that are so essential to peace. Um, so it's, I, I think we, I think we can move forward, um, but that's, uh, hope is not what I rely on for that. I think we need to take Kimberly's approach and everyone mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. You know, it, this is a long time coming because we have lacked the political will to do this. And the only solution for this is a political solution. As we approach the one year anniversary of this catastrophic tragedy, what has been going on in Uvalde to move toward recovery, resilience, um, solidarity, and healing? I don't think that there's any moving forward until we have answers, and until there's accountability. So we're all kind of just stagnant right now. Um, those that can move forward are beginning that journey, and those of us who will never be able to move forward are doing our best. Do you feel you have started to see accountability from the state? No. I just want to know what happened that day. I want somebody to say we messed up. For the record, the Texas Tribune is one of several news organizations, a consortium of news organizations that are suing the state seeking the release of investigative forensic and other files relating to the tragedy. Um, so far, our legal request is uh, pending before the courts as we speak. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move, if you don't mind, to some questions from our audience. Um, let's start with um, the one at the top. New literature shows that active shooter trainings are themselves terrifying to students and can have negative mental health effects. Are they worth doing? I'd love to start, actually, uh, Kimberly. Did, did your daughter ever or have, go through such trainings? Uh, yes, uh, they went through trainings. Um, that day, they did what they were told to do, um, and it wasn't effective. And they had trained before that day? Yes. Yeah. 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 And it wasn't effective. Not, I mean, it ended up concentrating the kids. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, we had a situation where I live in Oregon just last week where there was a, the report of a, a, a shooter in the school. It turned out to be completely false. But the anxiety about that rippled through the community in a way that was palpable uh, just for a day. And I think that uh, there are many, many people who are very concerned about the, the burden that young people bear of living in a, in a way that, where they're told this is, this is a constant risk that you have to think about. So I think that there are mental health burdens to this kind of training. I, I, I think what we need to do is make sure that we're approaching this very complex problem from multiple fronts and not looking for single solutions, silver bullet solutions. Apologies for that analogy. It's very inappropriate. Um, the, uh, and, and, and I think this, this, is, this is once again, is, a, is an example of the emphasis on um, uh, on things that don't really deal with the root cause. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that I'm a, I think they do have a psychological burden. They may have some practical benefit in some circumstances. I'm not expert on that. But I do think that it feels like by emphasizing that approach at the expense of others, we're not dealing with the core issue. It's gotta be holistic. Yeah. Um, this leads into our next question from a, um, an audience member named Sophia who asks, I'm a young teacher and I feel worried every time I enter a classroom, every time. Any advice for teachers who are deterred from entering the field because of this? Otis? That's a big issue. Mm -hmm. Lots of teachers are leaving the profession because of these threats, but also 
others that have just made it so difficult uh, for them to do what they're really wanting to do, which mm -hmm. is to make sure our kids are learning. Um, I don't know that allowing them to bring guns to school is an effective remedy as well because it increases their anxiety again about who has the gun, is it secured, um, and you know, more guns is not what would keep anyone uh, or make anyone feel more safe. Um, so I don't know what the answer is here when it comes to how to re-retain re teachers within settings where policy has totally failed them. When I say in terms, when I say policy has failed them, there hasn't been a comprehensive approach that gets at the root causes that Nick also mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that we, we need to think differently about our approaches because the ALICE trainings or the drills that uh, you just mentioned, uh, the doubling down on technology um, and some of these other responses have been knee-jerk responses that have not been tested. Uh, they have not been proven to decrease injury or death or even uh, the, the bringing of firearms or weapons to school. So we, we have to do something different. Mm -hmm. We have to do something different. Is the, in general, do you think that the approach that you take of gun violence as a public health crisis, is that message getting through to America? Well, it's definitely getting through to the public health field, right? I mean, it's, it's something that um, we've known for, for quite a while. Uh, where I think it stops is when Congress is lobbied by the NRA, which then you know, funds these uh, campaigns and the vote, then stops us from even collecting data. For two decades, we were not allowed mm -hmm. to collect data on gun violence. Mm -hmm. The CDC, the NIH, mm -hmm. uh, Department of Justice could not touch gun violence data. So we've literally had this vacuum, right? This, this, this blind spot in our gun violence policy that couldn't even be informed by best practices about actual data collection on events. We had to rely on the Gun Violence Archive and these other uh, entities to collect data. So we have failed families, we failed schools. Our policy has been ineffective, and it's time that we hold the political leaders accountable for all of these deaths. Now, I understand that there's, you know, a shooter, but that shooter would not have that option if we had effective gun violence policies mm -hmm. and preventions in place. So our political leaders are accountable. One questioner asks, what are your thoughts about why mass shootings are so high now when U.S. gun ownership was higher and bullying was worse in the 1960s to 1980s? I'm not entirely sure if the premise of the question is completely accurate, but I'd love your thoughts. Yes, I'm not sure. I would have to do some research on the premise of that question too. I think that, that one of the one of the ironies of the current circumstance in the United States is that when there is a mass shooting, purchase of firearms increases yeah. after that. And I think that that's very telling because what it says is that people believe that owning a firearm will make them safer. Mm -hmm. And so when they feel threatened by the existence of a, of, a, of, a, of a mass shooting, then they tend to think, well, I'll get a gun and that'll make me safe. And the research shows. And the research is absolutely clear. And this is an important opportunity from a public health point of view. Owning a gun makes you less safe. I know there may be people in the audience who are like, hang on, that can't possibly be true. But I'm telling you, having a gun in your home makes you less safe. The most likely reason that you'll be less safe from that gun is through an accident or suicide. Now, many people will say, oh, but that wouldn't happen to me. You'd never know, right, what might happen. And the idea that having a gun makes you safer because it allows you to deal with a home invasion or something like that is a very small possibility. And the possibility that the gun will harm someone <coughs> through accident or, or suicide is much more significant. 
So I think one of the things that we can talk to people about is the fact that actually owning a gun doesn't make you safer. That's a public health message. And that would stop this ratcheting up of the gun ownership. As things become more dangerous, people want to buy more guns. And we've seen gun ownership rise among communities of color as well. Right, right, of course, because they, for very understandable reasons, don't feel safe. And so, and so but then the problem is, as you ratchet up the gun ownership, you actually ratchet up the likelihood of gun violence. Living in a community as you do, which has, it's part of Texas, there is kind of a gun culture. Do you think that this shift in mindset can occur? I'm hopeful that it will. Um, how do you look at the facts and argue with that? Um, I myself am not a gun owner, so I don't have a lot of expertise in that. But had you grown up around guns or been exposed no. to them? You had not. No. Yeah. 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 Um, this next question, I think I'm going to direct at you, Kimberly. How can we consistently keep pressure on people in power for proper gun laws when they choose to focus on distractions such as the safety or the danger of drag queens? The drag queens are not committing mass murders in schools. Mm -hmm. How can we hope to effectively address school shootings if we won't name and address the role of white supremacy in the risk factors for perpetrators of murders? <laughs> though, though, I, though I do want to note that in the case of Uvalde, the gunman was Latino and the community was majority Latino, but yes. please go ahead. Yeah, but, but this is an important question because although not all perpetrators are white, white people are overrepresented in perpetrators. And I think from a psychological perspective, it, it feeds into some of the themes I was talking about before, this uh, aggrieved entitlement. And so we do need to understand, especially white men, uh, are dramatically overrepresented in committing these acts. And so understanding, you know, how do we provide, you know, Oh, there's so much to say about this, <laughs> and I know we're short of time, but it, I will just say I think it's a very important factor, and I think we need to find uh, ways to nurture young men, and particularly young white men, in a way that they can find their place in, 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 a, in a different society, a new society, and that they can embrace uh, nurturance and mental health and, and, and things like that in a way that they can't currently. And that, that's, a, that's a big topic, but I do think that it's, it's, from a psychological point of view, that's how I look at it. There's also obviously a very important political angle to this mm. too. That's what I was going to mention, yeah, the yeah. political angle here, because yeah. you know, for policies that are striving toward equity mm -hmm. um, and presidents banning diversity and inclusion practices, um, through executive orders, I think it it heightens this this grievance feeling mm -hmm. um, for certain populations to the point where um, even equality feels like oppression to people who have had um, you know benefits and and privilege. So it, I don't know how we're going to get around that. Um, yeah, you know, we can say mental health services is something that we need, but along with that. We need a new politic. We need political leaders who are responsible in their rhetoric, um, who understand that there are consequences for creating climates of hate, and that it motivates individuals who already um, are dealing perhaps with some issues, whether they're mental or, or otherwise, but um, in some cases, we are dealing with hate. We're not dealing mm -hmm. with mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so this is... You know, I, I hate to complicate it in that way because, you know, how do you address hate? But definitely our rhetoric and our politics, we need to think about reform in those spaces if we're going to address this, this grievance mentality of some of the shooters. With the gun control debate being so polarized, how do you, Kimberly, as a pro-gun control, pro-gun safety advocate, communicate effectively around this issue to make real change? I think just persistence. 
you know, we, we don't let them forget and we need allies. I need, we need people who are going to fight alongside us. Had you thought much about gun policy before this happened? I voted responsibly. I don't own weapons. It's as much as any of us can do. It wasn't enough. And so when you learned specifically that it was an AR-15 military grade assault style weapon, what was your reaction? Of course it was. Not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add that it's, it's here where policy becomes a little bit uh, uh, incoherent is, is an understatement, but uh, in some of these places, you, you can't get a handgun when you're 18 years old, but you can get the AR-15 mm -hmm. or the AK-47 because they're classified as rifles. Yep. And so it's those type of distinctions that I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is an easy fix. Texas, this is, this Texas is, in, is one of those jurisdictions. This is intuitive, yep. right? This is logical. This is reasonable. Um, but we've fortified uh, um, or we've created a climate where there are visceral reactions to anything related to gun safety um, in, in some uh, political areas or political landscapes. And it, somehow the common sense majority needs to take mm -hmm. stage and take over when it comes to uh, these type of conversations. Is that message resonating, Kimberly, that, that it's easier for an 18-year-old to get an assault rifle in Texas than it is to get a handgun? To those who agree with us, it's just common sense. But to those who do not agree with us, you know, we're just we're saying the same thing over and over again, and nobody's listening. It's been incredibly frustrating. It's very frustrating. How can we create soft or brave spaces in schools where we can place love and vulnerability at the forefront, starting with adults? Um, does compliance trump uh, socio-emotional uh, learning? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's an important theme in what, what we're saying here today. In any multi-sectoral uh, response, to the phenomena of, of violence in schools, we need to look at gun safety policy. We need to look at mental health, but not in this narrow sense of, we do need more mental health services in schools, but that's only one component. And I do think these broader cultural and contextual issues in schools need to be dealt with. We've already touched on, how does it feel to be in a school that has uh, metal detectors? How does it feel to be in a school that's doing these active shooter trainings and so forth. What are we doing to balance up the experience of young people uh, through social and emotional learning programs and things like that, that actually, that actually nurture them to grow uh, as, as into the adults that we want them to grow into. So that's, I think that this is a very important component and we just have to make sure that we're looking at the problem from these multiple angles and having multiple uh, policy responses to it. And I think this is a very important one. One of those angles is from the student's perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, we always have these conversations and it's a bunch of adults, policymakers, mm. school leaders, parents, um, but we rarely ask kids how do they feel in those contexts. Mm -hmm. When they see images of George Floyd on TV and then go into the school building and is greeted with a police officer that asked them to empty their pockets. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that feeling? Mm -hmm. And how can we address that? Even if we really need those metal detectors, how else might we offer something that provides balance and allows them nonetheless to have a feeling of connectedness and safety in those schools? Mm -hmm. We've approached the end of our time, but Kimberly, I wish to give you the last word. As these educators, teachers, uh, educational innovators, change makers, thought leaders, go back home to their communities, what would you like them to take away from and remember from this discussion? First, I want you just to appreciate your children and your students. You never really know when it's the last time that you see them. I hope you remember Lexi's story, and I hope you hear 
how to make change and you join us. Kimberly Matarubio, Otis Johnson, Nick Allen, thank you so much for your time, for this thoughtful discussion, and for sharing. Really appreciate it. I will never forget this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.